us uh, for this uh, special webinar on LGBTAQI plus rights and movements. Today, um, we are lucky to be joined by Welcome. And Welcome will be talking about um, his book, uh, Boy on the Run. So we, we are looking forward to hear more about your book and um, the sort of inspiration that um, drove you to write uh, such a beautiful piece. Uh, Boy on the Run is a staggering exploration of identity through grief, love, and friendship. Um, Levitious readers uh, will have uh, sort of um, an, a, a, an exploration of, of his self-expression. They will laugh, they will cry, and uh, possibly the book will change their lives. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome Mandla to our special webinar. Uh, thank you for making time and um, we're looking forward uh, to hear more about your book and um, you know what we can take um, from your book you know in relation to LGBTQIA rights and movements you know across Thank the you. world across Africa. So I will hand over to Andres who is going to facilitate. Um, I'm told that it will be interactive. Uh, he's got a couple of questions for you and then you will respond to those questions. And then uh, we'll take it from there with the Q and A session. Wonderful. Thank you for right. having me. Okay, uh, no. welcome once again. I'm also on the road, hey, uh, but lost, I was in load shading, but then I think we can start. So I'd really, um, I'd really like to welcome everyone else and especially you welcome, especially you welcome for making time to come speak to us. I think I'm really excited. Uh, we've been hearing that you are writing a book and when it finally came out, you came out with a masterpiece. I've read it myself and really would like to also thank Jakana, uh, publishers who have published the book. I mean, it's an amazing piece for those that haven't read it. You find it all over the country at, at exclusive books and other bookstores. So yeah, welcome. Uh, once again, welcome to the Center for Civil Society. Uh, like I said, you've, uh, we didn't expect this, especially at this time of the year, you know, uh, and with what is happening around the uh, around our country and you come with this book. So I'll just get into it. Uh, um, what, have, what has inspired you to, 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 I mean, to write Boy on the Run? Um, first of all, thank you for having me and for everyone who's listening, participating or joining us on this call. Um, and for the kind words, of course, on the book. Um, I, it's been a long time coming, writing this book. Um, but um, I, I think I officially started in 2018. Um, but the the main the main impetus for why I had to write this book or what inspired me to write this book is uh, is the tragedy I experienced at the age of 12, um, having lost my mom. I witnessed uh, I walked in on a tragic scene where my mom's boyfriend shot my mom and shot himself. And I was 12 and I, I remember this vivid scene of seeing both of them in a pattern of blood at the age of 12, at the tender age of 12. And of course that is a very traumatic, tragic incident to happen that really shaped my life drastically. And for most of my life, I always felt like my mom's life was, was cut short, that it was not given the due, the credit it deserved. And the memories I had with her were things I, I, I had cherished. I, I started journaling from a, from a young age and, and that really became a saving grace for me. And in that process of journaling and writing, I realized that my, the memories I had with my mom were now just memories and I wanted to I wanted to make them I wanted to hold space for them for those memories because those memories 
I have of my mom are very loving. They are very loving memories. They are very sweet memories between the two of us. And it's that love that I had with her that keeps encouraging me um, to be the best version of myself because I want to make her proud. And the femicide is real in South Africa. Women are killed every other day, if not every other 11 minutes. I think that was the latest statistic I had heard. And so, yeah, that, so it became important for me to write this book because I know that the story of grief as a result of gender-based violence isn't just my story, but it's everyone else's story who's lost someone, whether from gender-based violence or from natural causes or, or whatever reasons, but death is, is, is prevalent. Even in the time of COVID, many people have experienced grief and, and when we're losing people during COVID, I was more encouraged to see this book to the finish line because I believed that it was gonna encourage and inspire many people out of their grief. But also I wrote this book because as a queer, as a young black queer kid, I hadn't seen myself represented in books. I hadn't seen black township life represented in books in ways that spoke to me. So I really took Toni Morrison seriously when she said, write the book you want to read. And in many ways, Boy on the Run is the book I wanted to read. Oh yeah, certainly. And I, I mean, I think one key thing that comes across when you go with the book, when you're reading the book, is the fact that you, you bring in the black struggle, how you, it feels to grow up in a township. And as you've mentioned, you're a queer uh, uh, black male. And when you, I think it's one part where you speak about how you were treated from an earlier age uh, in regards to your sexuality. Uh, where p people would then call you names on the streets. We know that it's, you know, they'll call me Mofi, uh, Trazi, and all those things. And do you think, based on that, like, based on your experience back then and now, do you think things are changing in social movement and other townships in South Africa? Do you feel that queer people are treated differently or it's still the same experiences? I think certainly things are, things are changing, things are evolving. I think there has been a big movement in terms of the representation of queer people and we are no longer uh, a rare sight um, that when people, people see queer people in TV and in film and, and magazines, more regularly, it's not, it's not enough, more regularly than they used to, but still the way they are seen, the way we are seen is still very dangerous. It's still often damaging narratives um, that are affirming, you know, the queer people as almost a freak show for, for, for heterosexual people or for this heteropatriarchal um, society. So I think things are, things are changing, but those changes also present with them new and unique opportunities uh, um, and challenges, challenges. Um, because in as much as there's more, just because there's more visual representation of queer people, it doesn't necessarily mean that the lives of queer people are improved or made better because there is still, there is still violence, you know, and, and we are not seeing justice um, for a lot of the violence that occurs. Um, there have been a, several several cases in the past few years of, of brutal murders that are really driven by hate, um, hate crimes really against LGBTI people. And we are not seeing our government, our law enforcement taking decisive action on, on trying to bring about people, queer people like this and yeah, and I, so I think I think that's a that's a that's still a prevalent thing, and it's not only prevalent for for queer people, you know, because I talk about gender-based violence and and my mom having lost her life to her boyfriend, and even today, like I when was it last year, I was trying to get a protection order with the police, and I went through the most the one of the most difficult times I would say possibly after losing my mom because of the violence you experience at the hands of police um, with them 
treating you ill um, or thinking you are not worthy of justice and dignity because you're queer. So I think those, those challenges still persist and justice for the queer community, justice um, based on gender-based violence is, we still have a long way to go. Um, before, before you know, things before we can say things are really taking a turn for the good. Um, but I, I certainly think, yeah, there's some changes are happening. But we need, we need justice. We need real, actionable change from our governments, from law enforcement. The what is it? The um, hate hate crime bill um, that has been sitting with, with the National Assembly for nearly two, three years now and hasn't been passed into law. That hesitation is, if anything, an indication that this is not a priority for, for our government and for our leaders. And if anything, I think our this visibility that we're seeing um, and the kind of platforms that digital and social media allows for us to connect I really hope that those platforms make room for us to come together and be able to assert more clearly what our demands for justice, for equality, and for dignity are as a, as a community and as a collective, because no one is going to come and save us but ourselves. Yeah. And welcome. I think just to take you a bit back, I know you spoke about your your mom and how you lost her tragically and and you know i think most of the part most parts of the book actually the book is about overcoming grief and difficult challenges uh, that one goes through um were there any difficult parts uh, when you were writing the book because i mean you had to revisit a lot of memories you have to relive uh, the time that you had with your mother some of your friends good memories and bad memories. Was there any part where you found it very difficult to uh, write the book? <laughs> okay, someone needs to read them. I think they're fine now. Um, yes, there were certainly a lot of a lot of difficult parts. Like there are parts in, of the book that I wrote with tears streaming down my face because they were so hard. But I think more than, more than um, reliving the difficult moments, more than reliving the difficult moments, I think the big, one of the big things to do was communicating those difficult emotions um, to my reader because I committed to writing an honest book, you know, one that does not gloss over or romanticize grief, pain, and struggle. And, and for me, in order for me to do that, I had to be honest about what it is that I went through in the process of dealing and one could say overcoming the grief. But the finding the words to, to communicate to the reader, having to sit with the emotions, the difficult emotions is one thing, okay. but having to find the words for the emotions um, was, something else and it was in the process of finding the words for the difficult emotions that I was able to to start seeing the light and and start and came out you know at the end of this um more polished um and and healed like I've it really propelled my my healing journey to new heights, having to, to sit with the uncomfortable emotions. So de definitely looking back at some memories with my mom and some of the other difficult um, moments I experienced and sexual, sexual violence or harassment were also really difficult to, to, to write and, and, and go through. And also the other, the other most difficult thing in terms of writing about one's painful experiences and traumatic gender-based violence or any form of violence, one's memory, one's, one's experiences as, as valid, as correct, as truthful. Like, did this really happen to me? Am I overreacting? Was this violent? Was it not? 
um, and and having to to find a voice, having to find my own voice through all of that was was certainly hard, but it was hard it was hard and difficult, but for the best because it really made me trust my voice and trust my my experiences, trust and believe that my experiences of the world are uh, are legitimate and that they are valid and that they are mine. You know, they are not anyone else's but mine. And I cannot heal from them or from my wounds if I don't own my story. And writing this book and reliving some of the difficult moments and finding the words for those difficult moments was certainly me finding and owning my voice. And that is not an easy thing to do. So yeah, no, thank you for that welcome. I think another thing that you wrote about it is that we are in a time in South Africa where education is, is, is not really encouraged. And we look at your story, your story comes from grief and you went through school. You did very well at school as well. And you studied until masters. I think one question that I've got uh, from one of the guys that are reading that book, they said that, do you think with how South Africa is going currently, do you think there's still a, a space for education within South Africa? I mean, you look at things like unemployment, uh, you look at uh, challenges that people face to get into university. Do you still feel that there's space for to encourage people to get into university, especially people from poorer backgrounds that we come to have known? Yes, oh, absolutely. I think, I think education access to... Higher, higher education um, is, is very important and, and all the more reason why if we must, you know, all raise our voices and fists um, to say that everyone should have access to, to education, to university education, to good, um, to good schooling education as well. Um, there's, there's, definitely, there's definitely room for that in South Africa and the unemployment, the challenges that we are facing, <clears throat> of course, it's not a one solution. There, there isn't a one. There isn't one solution to all the to all the problems we are facing. But education is certainly a very important part of it, and I think it's important because it allows us to reflect as a nation. It allows us to sit with our problems, with our challenges, and, and, and think about them, and think about them deeply. And in thinking about them deeply, are we able to come to solutions? Are we able to think more clearly? Because the problem with violence and, and poverty and uh, the problem with violence and poverty and discrimination, racism, homophobia, yeah. is that they, they take time, they, the anger that um, is caused as a result of these on, on our people is so it's, it's, in, it's through education that we're able to, to think more clearly, more carefully without the cloud of the anger. Um, of of the violence and poverty that that we experience. I mean, I don't think had it not been for for school, certainly, I don't think I would have been able to write this book, especially in the ways that I have written it. And and I think the book is important because it allows us to reflect more deeply around these challenges. Um, I was saying earlier in an interview about the gender-based violence story is, is in South Africa a hashtag moment, you know, like I see so and so, justice for so and so, and after a day or two, three, maybe a week later, yeah, we, people go back to to normal um, or to their to their lives, and and the people who are mostly devastated by by these incidents are uh, left to pick up the pieces by themselves. And the people who hashtag and carry on with their lives are left without a, a deep or a profound 
understanding or appreciation of the problem and how deep it runs. Um, and it's in people not having the, the deep understanding or appreciation of the problems that they are not able to be proactive or useful in, in the process of bringing up solutions. So education is so important on, on so many levels, you know, before, yeah, I, 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 but I think the most important one is that it allows us as a nation to really reflect on our conscious, on our ways of doing things, on the impact of our ways of doing things and to question if those ways of doing things are useful for us as a collective. And, and I think more and more people, more and more young people need to be given the chance and the opportunity to help, help reflect deeply on these problems because you can't. And that's why access to resources to, um, access to resources, land and everything is important because it's difficult to reflect and write and think about a problem deeply when you have to worry about food at the end of the day. And, and that is a big challenge um, in, our, in, in our society that many young people because of unemployment are really thinking of you know, surviving more than how we can thrive as a nation. And I think when people have access to education and hopefully not only about how they themselves want to thrive, how their families want to have or can thrive, but how we as a nation can, can begin to think about what thriving might look like. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you speak about a lot of issues in, in your book, and I think that's one important thing that comes out for me. Uh, you speak about gender-based violence. Um, you speak about challenges of being um, a queer male. And also, you also speak about, you know, challenges that one gets when they get to university. And we've seen it. I mean, when you were in university and you highlighted nicely in your book, uh, there's an episode where, I mean, you took leadership, you got involved into student uh, politics. And uh, within their movement, I mean, you're an independent candidate. Within politics, there was a point where you were violated. Uh, sexually and such cases are happening everywhere in South African universities. We see students um, having to have sex with people before they can get into university and all that. Um, do you think as, as universities are doing enough to protect students in regards to, to, to such in these incidents? And are we, how, do you, how does one get to be vocal about them? Especially if you're coming from a place, a rural place or, or a place like, um, a township area like where you grew up in social Groove. I think that I'm going to go back to my point idea about trusting your um, trusting that your experiences of the world and what you're experiencing is legitimate and that it's valid as a as a response to your um, to the last part of your question about how to how to navigate these challenges as someone from say previously disadvantaged background. Um, and I think by, by that, I mean, if it's, if it's not, because we're often so quick to question ourselves, um, we are not quick to jump to this is violence, this is not right. We always think maybe I'm not getting something. Maybe this is not, this is, maybe I wasn't meant for this. Maybe instead of realizing the moment that violence happens, that actually this does not sit right with me in my body, in my heart, in my feelings and in my soul. Therefore, it's not okay. And to speak out whenever that happens. And, and I think even my, my experience in, in student leadership was that I had no model, so to speak, for, for what it looked like for a black queer boy like me to be in these positions. And so I relied on my instincts of what felt right to me and my body um, to say that 
I'm gonna stand for I'm gonna stand for these issues. And and I, it's true that it happens to a lot of to a lot of people in many ways. Um, and it's destructive because you know I had I had high hopes. I was very I was a hopeful kid when I took up those roles at university. I had I had hopes, and I think if you've read it, you'd know like my speeches there for canvassing were very hopeful, and I, I I thought you know I could bring about change. But you experience something like that um, that then demoralizes um, that spirit of. I want to make a difference. And I think universities are best, it's best for universities to recognize that if students are violated, if students are made to feel like they don't belong, they are not gonna, their whole purpose of producing them as leaders who are gonna function in society is kind of curtailed and they aren't given the opportunity to, in, they, they have to overcome other hurdles of overcoming these, these personal challenges instead of really focusing on the bigger goal of making a difference. So I think universities can, first of all, take stock because at the moment, I don't think universities realize the costs of violence on, on a lot of students, not only on the students themselves or the universities themselves, but on our country, someone is, is raped and they were a project of making that would make South Africa better. The first, the project is going to take several seats um, now that this person has to overcome these, these challenges. And, and we lose out because that energy that was supposed to be channeled towards improving the state of our country is now channeled towards nurturing wounds um, and wounds that are necessary, wounds that are inflicted daily. And yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of challenges with our universities today. I don't think, I don't think the, our universities have a grasp on, on, on wellness, well-being, the well-being of the student, and how that is important to, to the overall project of, of higher education. Um, it's almost as though mental well-being um, is, is a tertiary, not so significant issue. And and I think I think universities can do better by by putting more systems in place or processes um, to um, one make sure that students are protected and that there is justice for violence that occurs. Um, but most importantly, that the well-being of students is is considered um, because we don't want to also produce leaders who do not have a sense of their own well-being. Um, we want to have a, I think it's best that when, when we, um, that ac ac academia is not just a, an intellectual project that is separate from, you know, emotional well-being and other forms of well-being. I think it's time universities really thought holistically about you know, what higher learning is, what, what it means to be a better, higher version of yourself. So welcome, I, you know, I think I, another thing that we really, it's important to discuss is uh, like, what does the book mean for an ordinary man or an ordinary township boy? What, do, what would you want them to take away from it? I think the most important thing is that I want, I would like for them to see a glimpse of themselves. Um, I would like for them to see a glimpse of themselves because as someone who grew up queer and black and it, it was difficult. I know the difficulty of looking for external validation, 
that what I am is okay, what I am matters, what I am is of good value. And we are constantly having to copy and paste ourselves into narratives. We're constantly having to imagine ourselves into stories that have nothing to do with us. And um, I, I, by writing this book, I hope that the ordinary man, boy, girl, they, them, um, in the township, sees a glimpse of themselves and sees a glimpse of themselves not entirely romanticized and not entirely bastardized or entirely um, tarnished, um, but to see, to see a glimpse of themselves as complex, as complicated, as, as fragile, as tender, as loving, because there, especially black, black boys, I mean, for everyone, but there are so many damaging tropes about what it means to be a black boy today. And, and I don't identify, and I know many people, many black boys who don't identify with most of the tropes that, that are rampant on, on what it means to be black. Black boy, a black boy today. So I hope that you know black boys see themselves differently, that they feel loved by by reading this book. Um, because I know what it's like to see myself in in someone else's story. The the kind of validation that comes with seeing myself in someone's story, and. And for township kids, I, I was writing this book so that people who are from the township identify as having been there could, could have that experience of, of seeing their stories validated in my story. And I hope they are encouraged to continue to seek justice for themselves, to seek ways of living joyful lives amidst the difficulties, the difficult, the difficulties of being black and of being queer in this country. And yeah, I, I really hope people are emboldened somewhat also to, to tell their stories and to tell them well. I mean, I think you and Jakarta Media, it's a good collaboration. I mean, they are good publishers. Uh, amongst, in some of, uh, in the country, you are amongst one of the best sellers. How does that feel? <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it's so early days, I feel, um, because it's been what? Because we launched, it's still, it's July now. Oh yeah, we launched at the end of June. Um, so mid July, um, how does it feel? I mean, it feels good. The feedback has been wonderful. When I finished writing this book, I was so sad. I was like, because writing it became a way or a portal, so to speak, for me to, to wrestle with these difficult feelings um, that, that, that I had in me. And so when I stopped writing this book, when I finished writing this book, I was sad and I was like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do now with all these difficult emotions? How am I gonna make sense of them? And the feedback from my readers, <laughs> it feels good to say that my readers, um, the, feedback, the feedback has been Wonderful. It's reminded me of why I, even this moment, and talking to you about this book, is a reminder of why I wanted to write this book in the first place. And, and the conversations, every single interaction I have had with people who have read the book or have heard about it and want to read it, every single one of those interactions have been so loving and so affirming that they have given me more healing than I thought, um, even if in my own, you know, in dealing with these challenges, because it's not done. 
You know, just because I've written about it and I've put it in a book doesn't mean that it's my my feelings and my emotions on these difficult emotions are also on the shelf. Um, but the 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 interactions I've had with people, yeah, I have writing the book has brought me so much healing. But the conversations I've been having with people have brought even more light and healing in in my life. And and for me, that that means the world. Um, you know more than the best selling. Although we do like to be best selling, um, so. Um, yeah, I get get the book, and I mean, I worked I worked on the book when I was writing the book. I was deliberate in that I wanted it to be a good book. I wanted to offer my readers a wholesome experience, and and it's been so incredibly validating to hear people say they have been moved by it. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll just ask one last question and open up to the floor because I think we've been uh, talking and having a dialogue. Um, are you still on the run? I think a lot of people <laughs> are asking that question. Are you, are you still on the run? <laughs> Am I still on the run? <laughs> um, I mean, it's a, it's a yes and no Um question am i still on the run i mean i feel like i certainly should have given some serious consideration to this question um but uh, am i having much am i still on the run yeah you know like i'm still on the run i definitely am still on the run and the run initially was an escape was an escape to to run away from from the difficult emotions and the difficulties of this life and i mean the travel writing element was also part of the the run, you know, um, the escape. But my run now is not my run now is not for is not from from pain, um, is not from grief because I have found ways, especially in writing this book, I have found ways to to live with with pain and grief and. And so my run now is, and I'm gonna keep running, <laughs> um, is for is to really become the best version of myself that I can possibly be, to make my mom proud. That run is never gonna stop. Um, but also to make my contribution to our society, to South Africa, and to the world um, at large. Uh, I will be um, using. Uh, for as long as I have breath in my air, you know, for I have aired my lungs, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, for as long as I, I live, you know, I want to, I want to put it to use. I want it to count. I want it to count for something. And and my run is is for that. Like, how can I how can I run that race <laughs> um, such that. It matters so that at the end of it, when my life is no more, like I can, I can take that deep sigh and say, I ran my race, you know? Like we talk about people running their race when people are dead, um, like, oh, they ran their race, but how's your race? How are you running your race, you know? And, and I'm running my race to, to shine light in the world because I have seen that this world is full of darkness, it is corrupted and it needs light, it needs love. And if you can offer it by God, do offer it. And and that will make your your race, running your race all the more, all the more worthwhile. If you can, like Maya Angelou said, if you can be a rainbow in someone's cloud. You know, like you would have, you would have done something, and and that's what that's what I'm I'm trying to do. That's that's what my run is about now. Is about how can I how can I make this how can I leave this place better than I found it. 
Exactly. And I think that's what we should all strive for, to live in this place better than how we have found it. So I'm just going to open the floor. I see Kobani has asked the question. Kobani, would you like to uh, unmute and then ask a, a question directly to welcome? And uh, to those that have questions as well, can you please show by raising your hands or typing in the chat bar, then we can read them out. Kobani? Sure. Thank you so much. I've um, been really loving um, this conversation. I just had a quick question. My question was, um, I guess, um, are there any surprises or things that have surprised you the most in how people have responded to the book now that it's out in the world? So either the book in its entirety or a particular se section that seems to, to have resonated in a particular way um, with, your, with your readers. I hope I'm making sense. Um, yes, thank you, Kavani. Um, the, I think the most surprising thing that I can think of, um, I'll, I'll keep giving this some thought, but the most surprising thing for me has been, like, I was surprised that people, <laughs> people <were> read it. <laughs> and um, I mean, like, read it. I feel like people read it so fast. I, I, a friend of mine, yeah, I think I, I made a I made a joke the other day that oh my gosh, I spent years because someone said, Oh, they got the book on their way to the airport. And they said they couldn't put it down the next day. Within two days they were done with it. And I've had I've had a few people say they've like, oh my gosh, they just couldn't put it down. Or as soon as soon, shortly after the book came out, I was, you know, I would ask people would be like, oh, I'm reading. And I was always like, Oh, so how far are you? And I've just been shocked uh, by how far how far people have read. Um, and it was uh, my joke was, oh my gosh, I spent years writing this book only for people to read it in two days. Um, but yeah, so that has been that has been surprising. Another very surprising um, thing for me, pleasantly surprising, is hearing from mothers. Um, you know mothers to sons um, talk about how I talk about my relationship with my mom and that if it if they could be you know half the mom my mom was to me to their kids they would have they would have done better and um, there was a, a review as well in news 24 um, recently and the person who also wrote it, said as a young mom herself, she really could identify with the challenges of, of a young mom. Um, because I, I think I have been also very honest in a way that is almost um, nerve wracking about the complexities of my relationship with my mom. I tried to not romanticize it because she was young and she needed, she still needed to, she, she still needed good time with her friends. She was pretty much run about my age when she was, when she passed on. So um, hearing from my friends who are roughly my age and some of my peers who are, who are mothers talk about that, um, that relationship and, and parenting and parenthood um, given how my mom was to me. Yeah, that was, that was very surprising. Um, that's been pleasantly surprising um, to know that, that parents, mothers, young mothers, you know, see, see themselves um, as well in the book. Thank you. See to this message. Oh yeah, I think uh, there's a, a comment here that you were able to share, we were able to share your mother with you through your book. And as I am also an orphan, your book has made me to strive to become a better parent because even if we are orphans, it is possible for us to have better futures and become better people. So I think that's really nice. Um, <laughs> that's the one that makes me want to cry. Like my eyes are getting a bit teary, getting nuts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dad, did you have a, I think Dad has got a question as well. 
Stanford. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Andres, uh, for this uh, good facilitation. Uh, thank you, uh, speaker, for sharing, you know, your, your pain and your joy with us. It's, uh, you know, very inspiring um, and hopeful at the same time. I just have one question. Um, what does uh, the book title Boy on the Run mean to you? particularly if we are to relate it to the theme of this webinar. Um, the, theme for, the theme for Boy on the Run, um, as um, like I said, it was, you know, um, initially it was the, the kind of escape, like how do I escape, how do I escape grief? How do I escape violence? How do I escape pain, how do I escape myself? Because society has made me out to be like a viral plague. Um, so, so I know that a lot of queer people have almost wanted to flee themselves because when you become a site of of shame for everyone else, you know, it becomes difficult to live in your own skin. And I know it's, it's, it was difficult for me at some point to live in my own skin. And I mean, we know that queer people, especially trans people are constantly, have the highest suicide rates, you know? And that is, that is where, do, where do you go? Where do you run? when? everyone else around you, where, when every um, safe, when every outlet that is supposed to be safe sees you as a, as a side of shame. And even in my, when I was talking about trying to find a protection order at some point and not like still never having served it and having the police say nasty things to me. Like I, I that was, I had never had, I felt suicidal. I had, I had suicidal thoughts because I was thinking, where am I gonna go? Where am I gonna go if it's not safe for me out there? And it's not safe for me even to approach the police. If I walk on the streets and people violate me, it would mean nothing um, to anyone. And, and so the, 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 on the question of, the topic of LGBTQIA plus rights. I think the run or burn the run theme is, how do you escape that? How do you overcome that? And, and I think the best thing to that, my best response to that is that, you know, we, we are gonna have to save ourselves. We are gonna have to find ways of loving and saving ourselves because waiting for someone to love and save us is gonna be more destructive and is not gonna yield into a productive run. So I, with the book and the themes in the book and what I write about, want to encourage queer people, black people, and women um, to say, find ways of, of loving yourself, of protecting yourself and standing up for yourself because you, you don't do yourself, we don't do ourselves justice by waiting for people to, to love, protect and stand up for us. Oh yes, certainly, certainly, I certainly agree with you. I think there's a comment from, uh, Paula, that says thanks a lot for sharing this. This is this honesty is an inspiration to me, and uh, I also saw a question from Tseko, uh where she's saying, "Firstly, congratulations on your memoir. Uh, you write about extremely heavy themes in your book. Did you find healing in writing the book? I think we've touched on yeah some bits of that, but have you found healing in writing the book?" Yeah, I saw, maybe we could add that. I saw there was another question. I'm not sure if it's still the same person. Around memory, what was that memory 
and accuracy. and how uh, how important was memory and accuracy whilst writing the book? Um, yeah, so I definitely found a great deal of healing while writing this book, no doubt. Um, but on the memory and accuracy thing, it was very important. I mean, I spoke to, so it was important. It's, just, it's such a, I feel like it's such a double-edged sword because there is your my memory of how things happen and how I remember things to have happened. And of course, accuracy is necessary to verify that memory with, with some external events. But my experience of the same thing is not gonna be other people's experience of the same thing. And it's we are often, we, it's so easy to silence yourself in that process of, is my version of this event correct? Is this the right, is this the right version of it? And when I couldn't, in cases where I couldn't find ways of, um, of of confirming whether an external source, or even in cases where I felt like this is too personal for me to want anyone else to validate this for me. Um, I've had to take a stand and I, I go back to, I think I said this earlier, that one of the most difficult things really about writing this book and all the difficult emotions was saying, was owning that this is my story. This is what happened to me. Um, and that is a great deal of memory and my experiences, perhaps maybe not so accurate, you know, but to me, that is my story. And that's how, that's how I remember things to have happened. And I have questioned myself a great deal and had a lot of anxiety, many panic attacks um, around, oh my gosh, my book is going to come out and I write about other people and they're going to have something to say about everything I write about and how I say it happened. And I've constantly had, had to remember that I didn't make anything up, you know? Like, of course I, I committed to the truth and I told stories that were important for me to tell, that were important for me to tell as part of telling my story. And in doing that, not everyone is going to be happy. Not everyone is going to agree with my version, but it is my version. And I have come to own that this is my version and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's been, it's been, of course, like I've, I've had a great deal of like conversations, for example, even writing about my family. I had a great deal of, long conversations with my gran, um, you know, about where she comes from, because in order for me to write about my mom, I mean, I had to write about her mom and her mom. Um, and so kind of bringing that, that maternal, my maternal lineage into the book was a, a special thing for me. And the, I mean, before the book came out, some family members were saying, is there anything we should be worried about? Um, well, I thought the, the only thing they really had to be concerned about was their sex. <laughs> 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 because, because I think the, the most the important thing is I put a lot of care into writing this book. Um, and when you write, when you write about other people, as I have been writing about other people pretty much um, my whole writing career. I know the value of, of the truth, you know, and the, the cost of, of error um, when, you are talk, when you are talking about other people. So um, I put a lot of care, my, my consolation to people who don't agree with me or my version of events is that I put a lot of effort into protecting the people I write about, um, but still staying true to my version of, of events. Um, and so accuracy and memory, I, my memories are, I, 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 I held on, I cherish them. And I said with them to really, 
make sure that what I, I remembered them as thoroughly as I could. And then when you read the book, I think I'm very thorough in how I share some of these experiences um, because I really had to go back and think thoroughly to each of the memories I write about. Um, and yeah, so that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, and it's an incredible story. Uh, welcome, just looking at the time, and I just have, you know, a bit of final remarks. For those of you who do not know the book, this is how the book looks like. You can find it at exclusive books and other major bookstores across the country. And to celebrate you, welcome. What we have done as the Center for Civil Society is that in the next coming webinars, because then we've got different webinars on this theme, we'll be giving away your book uh, as well. Um, as a book that I've related to, I mean, I, for me, it was not an easy read. It's, you know, I, the points where, you know, I felt like crying and dropped tears and, you know, as I progressed through it. And I, it's, a, it's a book that speaks to one, especially from where we come from as a person to the challenges that we have within the country. So what we are doing is that we are partnering with different organizations. I think one is Ambassadors of Change uh, in Kailita. And they will be reading this book to different youths in the township. Because uh, that through that, I believe that the message here can encourage them to become better people. And change starts within our communities, our townships. So we'll be partnering with different organizations in South Africa, especially in major townships, so that the young ones can understand what the book is. And to those that haven't, you know, uh, gotten the, the book as yet, I, I suggest that you get it and you read it. Uh, it's, it's a book that speaks to everyone else. You can, you know, you can, uh, you can relate to it. And welcome to you. Um, I'd like to thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you for writing this and you and Jacana Media for publishing this book at this time. It's, it comes at a time where we need it in this country. There's a lot of gender-based violence that's going on. There's a lot of you know, harassments that are going on, a lot of injustices within our country and a lot of victimization. And you come and speak about this, but then at the same time, you show us that there are possibilities that we can become better people. And you have lost your mother at a very young age, but what your mother has instilled in you and something that you must, it, you know, it, it, it has encouraged us. We've never met her, but then through your book, we got to live with her. And thank you very much. I think it, it's, 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 this is the most, yeah, the best woman I've been in because then I get to relate to it. Uh, you shed, yeah, I, I, I can say a lot of things, but then thank you. Thank you. And yeah, and thank you to everyone that has joined us today. I don't know then if you've got, any other last words that you want to say before we head over to have, uh, welcome? No, siya bonga, siya bulela. Thank you, welcome um, uh, for this, uh, for sharing your story with us, and um, we really appreciate your work. Um, I'm just going to buy the book and uh, just uh, you know walk the journey with you and um, see how I can relate to it. I I know uh, you know judging from 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 uh you know the conversation we just had that it is uh it is very relatable thank you andres and thank you welcome for making you know time to come and and share your work with us siabon and welcome any final remarks from your side well, thank you. I was a bit teary there for a second. Um, so thank you um, for having me and for this beautiful, beautiful conversation and for the love that you have shown me and my work. And it encourages me to keep writing and to keep sharing my story and shining my light um, to the world. Um, I can't thank you enough for, for the affirmation um, that this love and this conversation has has brought to me. Um, and thanks to everyone who's also sent comments, questions, and love everywhere, you know, um, and got the book and read the book. And to those who are even yet to read the book, you know, thank you. Thank you. I can't I can't say that enough. 
Thank you very much. Welcome. Guys, you must get the book, eh? It's a good read. Uh, and it's a good gift to give uh, to give as well. I'm matching, I'm matching the wall. I'm the <laughs> you mentioned the wall, yeah. The... <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, no, thank you very much to everyone else that joined us. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Good night.